embarrasses a lot of churches out there. Now, praise be to God, I don't believe that our church is one. But I do want to talk to you about something that I believe embarrasses a lot of churches out there. I don't think any church out there would just come out and say it, but I think uh, as I was in prayer, God put it on my heart, thinking about some, some things that I've heard in the uh, church growth seeker-sensitive movement and I, and I think that if some churches were honest about the philosophy that they are following, that there are a lot of churches out there that are um, embarrassed about the blood. And I want to talk to you about the blood of Jesus today. I thought about some of those things that, that I've heard out of some of the church growth strategies out there and some of the seeker-sensitive movement that, that uh, pervade uh, for some time in our culture. And there were some churches out there that had the idea that the way to grow your church is to take down the crosses out of your building, especially out of your worship center, because the cross offends people. And I have even heard testimony from some uh, traveling Christian groups, uh, song groups that go from place to place who have even been discouraged about singing some of the songs that we've sung today for the very same reason, because the blood offends people. But I want to remind you today about the benefit of the blood in the believer's life. Because listen, I'm not here just for shock value to talk to you about this today. I'm not here just to, to try to be controversial. I'm here to remind us that the blood is the basis for the believer's relationship with God. And aside from the blood of Christ, we don't have a chance to have a relationship with God. Somebody said amen. amen. Listen, I, I, I'm here to remind you today that the blood gives us tremendous blessings from that relationship and I want to tell you about just a few of them this morning while we're gathered together. I did joke uh, with our uh, online church family group that uh, those of you attending might want to bring a sack lunch, and I see some of you forgot. So I will, I will be as brief as the Holy Spirit will allow me to be today, all right? But I want to talk to you about a few benefits of the blood beginning in this passage here in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. And we're going to take a survey of some other passages in the New Testament that remind us of how blessed we are, those of us who have believed in Jesus and what He did on a hill called Calvary and how He raised from the tomb, showing us that His blood was enough for us. I want to remind you about the benefit and the blessings that believers have through a relationship with God through faith in His blood. Amen? Amen? So read this passage of Scripture with me. I hope I've talked long enough to give you time to find it. There, if not, it's in the right half of the book. Amen? Now listen to this passage of Scripture, and the Bible tells us, In Him, that being Jesus, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we come to you today and we are so excited and overwhelmed to be able to come together as a people to get to worship you, to exalt the name of your son, Jesus, that you would be glorified, Father. Lord, we pray that you would draw our hearts. Lord, you promised that if you would be lifted up, that you would draw all men to yourself. And we're, gonna, we're, we're claiming that promise today, God, and asking you to do in the hearts of people uh, of men and women and boys and girls, everybody here gathered together or online today, God, that if we're a believer, that you would encourage our hearts, that you would remind us of the benefits that we have and that we'd put them to work. And Lord, if there's anybody watching today or anybody in attendance that doesn't know you, that today would be the day that they fix that and that you fix it in their life through their faith in Jesus. And we ask it in his name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Boy, you uh, they, I just got to tell you, uh, between the last two weeks and uh, just talking to the camera, even just a little bit of the amen makes everything better. Amen. <laughs> Listen, I want to talk to you about a few benefits of the blood this morning. I'm going to point you over to Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. While you're there, I just want to tell you and I just want to remind you that it is the blood of Jesus that provides peace. It's His blood that provides our peace. Listen to this verse if you're there with me. And the Bible tells us that for in Him, that is in Christ again, 
all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That is, he became fully and totally, completely man, but he was fully, to, totally, and completely God at the same time because we needed somebody to bridge the gap between us and God. And he came to give up his life. And in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, verse 20, and through him to reconcile, that is, bring back together two things that were opposed to each other, to reconcile to himself all things, whether in earth or in heaven, by making Peace by the blood of his cross. The blood's the only way for us to have peace. When the Bible talks about that word peace, it's talking about having that inner sense that everything is right between you and God. And I don't know if you have looked in our world today, but it seems like everybody's looking for peace. Everybody's looking for peace in different ways. We might, we might not describe it by peace. We might, say, we might say that we feel broken. We might say that we feel like there's something missing in our life and we just can't put our, our thumb on what it is. We might feel incomplete. We might describe it that way. But listen, the problem is a real power called sin that came into the world when our first parents, Adam and Eve, broke God's rules. And we have been searching for peace ever since the garden. As a matter of fact, Adam and Eve were the first to try to create this peace for themselves. We know that after they sinned against God, we see the power of sin and shame and embarrassment over their actions against God and how they broke His rule, how it caused them to go into hiding, and then they tried to cover themselves up with figs and leaves. But I'm so glad to be able to remind you that God came and He sought them out in the garden. Because that's what God came to do. And He declared to them the first gospel message in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 that He was sending His Son into the world. And that while there would be enmity between the woman and her seed, that and the, serp and the serpent would strike His heel, speaking about the coming of Jesus, that when Jesus came that He would crush Satan's head. Amen. And give us victory. Amen. But it's only through Jesus. You know, today we're a little more sophisticated. I haven't seen anybody running around with uh, fig leaf coverings in, in quite some time. We are a little more sophisticated, but man still has the same basic problem. The problem called sin. And Jesus' blood is the only way to fix it and to give us the peace that our hearts need, that everything in our relationship with God has been made right again. God's solution for peace has always been faith in the blood of Jesus. You know how I know that? Because after Adam and Eve tried to cover their sin and cover their shame with those fig leaves, God gave them an illustration about what Jesus was coming to do. And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3 that God made a sacrifice of an animal and He covered them with this animal. We don't know, but I just have a hunch that it was a lamb. Because that, that animal was a picture about the blood atonement that God would require as a payment for sin. But we are a little more sophisticated in our day. I, I heard a, uh, an interesting statistic recently. Uh, during an interview, the President of the United States said that America is the biggest consumer of pharmaceutical drugs of any nation in the world. That's not to say that God doesn't oftentimes use medicine to bring healing. We would all agree He does. But that fact and that statement should tell us something about our culture. That America is the greatest, uh, biggest user of pharmaceutical drugs in the world. Hands down, there's not a nation that compares with how many pharmaceutical drugs we have. And take this into account. America is today the most prosperous nation in all the earth and arguably the most prosperous nation in all of history. You would think if any people who have ever lived would be able to find peace in the things of this world, it would be America. But we can't find it in material blessing and we, and we can't find it in pharmaceutical drugs either because the Peace of God only comes through a redeemed relationship through the blood of Jesus and our faith in Him. 
Listen, that means, just want to remind you that if you need guidance, that you can trust in Jesus because he's the great counselor. If you're in trouble, you can turn to Jesus because he sticks closer than a brother. Because with Jesus, blood truly is thicker than water. Amen? And he, it's his blood that provides us peace. Let me tell you about another benefit. Not only does the blood of Jesus provide our peace, but it's the blood of Jesus that brings power to your prayer life. Look over at this verse with me in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. And I want to show you how it's the blood of Jesus that brings power to our prayer life. That verse there in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22 tells us this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Amen. By the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain. Now this is important. That is through His flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Here's what that means. The day that you trusted in Jesus and what he did when he shed the, his blood on the cross and he raised from the grave, when you trusted in him, you got access to a power in prayer and a confidence in prayer that you didn't have before. That now, because of our faith in what he did, that we have a confidence and assurance of boldness that we can go boldly before the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. Just as the Bible tells us, that we can go in in assurance and confidence knowing that because of our faith in what Jesus did for us, that we know that our Heavenly Father hears us. And if it's good for us and it brings Him glory, He will give us anything we need to accomplish His will for our life. That doesn't mean he's, you can come to God with a blank check and rubber stamp it, just add Jesus' name on it and uh, pray real hard and get a brand new Cadillac. That's not how it works. But if it's good for you and it brings Him glory and it's in accordance with His will, you can know that He hears you and He will give you anything you need to accomplish His will for your life. And that ought to change our prayer life. Amen? And the passage refers to the holy places here. And it points back to the priesthood. Did you hear that? Saying that we have access to go into the holy places. And watch what he's doing here. Alluding to the fact that in the Old Testament system, that only on one day, the Day of Atonement, one man in the entire nation of Israel, the, great high, the, the high priest, could go into the Holy of Holies, behind what? Behind the veil, behind the curtain, and have access into what we might call the VIP room of God's holiness in His presence. One man, one time a year, and not without a blood sacrifice. But now, believers in Jesus living on this side of the cross, because of what He did for us, when He shed His blood, the Bible tells us that the veil was torn, the curtain was torn from top to bottom, meaning that God had made a way that no man could make on his own, not by our own goodness, not by our own works, but by the blood of Jesus alone, that God made a way, and that you and I have unfettered access to run into the lap of our Heavenly Father and know that He hears our prayers. Had a lot of downtime recently. Tried to take advantage of some of that to build some relationships with some folks in our church. And uh, been privileged to go fishing. Amen. Here recently. I was taken to a place. When we showed up on the scene, there was a big gate. It had a PIN code number over here. You had to have a, a code to get in. I was wondering if there weren't snipers in the woods, some, in the woods somewhere. <laughs> and I was unsure the first time we rolled up on the scene if we were going to have access to the blessings that I wanted. Amen. But then, because I know a guy, he punched in the code and I got to ride in on his coattails and get access to all the blessings. Amen. 
Here's what this Bible passage is telling us. That because we know somebody, his name's Jesus, that we get to ride his coattails to glory and that we can know that our heavenly Father hears us when we pray. And nothing can take that benefit away. We have, we have a new access. And listen, friends, that, that means, here, I just want to remind you of this, that we can stop living in fear and doubt about whether our Father hears us or not. Listen, He's not always going to tell us yes. The worst He's going to do is tell us no because He's got something better in mind for us. But we can go before His throne to leave our case to Him and leave the results up to Him. And some of us need to remember that we've got access to the Supreme Court of the whole universe. We've got access to heaven's highest court. And some of us need to start appealing our case before Him. You might say, well, who's going to represent me? Let me remind you that the book of 1 John says that Jesus is our representative before the Father. Well, who, who's he, what's the firm that he represents with? It's called God and Son. And friend, they ain't lost a case yet. And you can take your prayers to him knowing that he hears you and it ought to empower our prayer life. Somebody said amen this morning. Here's the next thing I want to tell you. Flip over there to that book of 1 John verse, chapter 1 and verse 7. In the blood of Jesus, here's another benefit. It purifies the believer's life. It purifies the believer's life. Listen to this verse of Scripture. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another because of the blood regardless of what makes us different or distinct, that because of the blood we have a bond together as a family. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. From all sin. Let me tell you about a far too common experience that I believe that you can probably identify with or you know somebody that's feel, that feels this way. Maybe you have felt this way from time to time in your own life. Listen, those of us that have believed in Jesus, we know we're saved. But we still mess up. We still feel guilt and embarrassment and we feel weighed down by it. And if we're honest with each other, there are seasons in our life, moments at least, where we kind of just accept it. We hear the preacher talk about freedom from sin and from its oppression, from its guilt and from its burden of shame. But for far too many of us, there are moments and seasons in our lives where we wonder if that's anything more than just preaching. Because in our life's experience, it's just not a part of our experiences following Jesus. But what God wants us to know is that if that's our experience, we are missing out on the blessing of His blood. And we need to be reminded of the ongoing effect of His blood in our life. I just want to point this out to you. This passage of Scripture, when it says that His blood purifies or His blood uh, cleanses, comes from a Greek term, uh, catharsis, that gives us our medical term for cleansing. And notice that it doesn't say that it cleansed us. Way back when, when we got saved, listen, it did that. But this is written in the present tense to remind us that the blood of Jesus is intended to have an ongoing effect and that it covers our sin and it washes us from, from our sin so that we can have a confident relationship with, with God because of the ongoing effect in the blood. And I, I just want to remind you of this. It said that it covers all sin. And it says that the blood cleanses. It doesn't say that the blood plus anything cleanses. Just, just the blood. The blood's enough. Amen. And that means that the blood of Jesus is good to cleanse from any sin. Listen, you may think, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. Listen, let me remind you about what Jesus did. He gave up His blood for us so that we could have a confident assurance of our relationship with Him. And the blood is good for any and every situation. Amen. There is a thing called, that uh, Tide came out with some time ago. These little bleach pens. Y'all ever seen them? Listen, I'm the world's worst about getting a brand new shirt and then trying to go to lunch somewhere with my family and 
It doesn't matter how big that napkin is. I end up getting the salsa on my shirt somehow. A brand new shirt. You have that experience? And I think, man, here we go. I just just ruined this thing that's brand new. But we got these bleach pens that we've got access to. And it removes any stain when it's applied. Some of us need to be reminded, listen, you were made brand new in Jesus the day you got saved. And you may feel like, man, I ruined it. Listen, the blood still works if you'll apply it. And there's a passage in 1 John 1, 9 that says that if we confess our sin to him, he is faithful and just to purify us from all sin. For instance, some of us need to go to our prayer closet today and apply the blood and know his cleansing power in our life again. Amen? The blood purifies us from sin. Here's the next thing I want to tell you about. We've got to get moving. Amen? Uh, not only does the blood purify us from sin, but listen, look over at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. I stayed uh, somewhere close for you to be able to turn over there. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verses 22. And listen, the blood, I just want to remind you, The blood is the only payment for sin that God accepts. The blood is the only payment for sin that God accepts. Listen to this passage. The Bible tells us, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without blood. You might underline this. You might underscore this. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness of sin. Listen, no matter what anybody else may tell you, no matter what voice, you listen to me, young people, no matter what culture may tell you as you grow up, the blood of Jesus is the only chance anybody has to get into heaven through faith in what he did. I tell you that because when I first decided that, uh, uh, discerned rather, that God was calling me to go to seminary, my pastor pulled me aside and he told me about an experience that he had in seminary. And you just had to know Brother Steve. But he was in a class and one of his seminary professors stood up before the class and told them that Jesus did not have to die to make atonement for our sin. Brother Steve, you know, making sure he wasn't daydreaming, he asked him to repeat it and he repeated again his assertion that Jesus did not have to die to make atonement for sin. Well, you just had to know Brother Steve, he stood up, turned around to the class, and he said, class is dismissed. Amen. Because that is a bunch of baloney from the world. Amen. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. God demands a payment of one life for another, that somebody would take our place to make atonement for us. A lot of us, that's basic Bible, but why? Why? Why does God require blood? Well, first, because it carries life. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11 tells us this, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for life. Listen, Jesus gave his life He lived a perfect life that none of us could, and He gave His life as a substitution, as a payment for our sins that we could know, that we know that what He did was enough, and we don't have to second guess His blood. Amen? And it's the only one that He accepts. Listen, I'm probably going to tell you something that's going to shock you about your pastor, but there was a time in my life where I was booked, you might say, Let me ease your conscience. It was over a minor traffic infraction. And uh, payday was running late and I forgot to make the last payment on this thing. And they were serious about the payment. I found out the little local police department there in Willica, Oklahoma was serious. They came down to my house, knocked on the door. I was getting ready for school. Had every intention in the world, good intentions to, to make the last payment when I got paid. But I was late, and they showed up to the house, and they had cuffs, and I got to ride in their brand new police car that our bonds had just bought down to the station. Listen, I was broke. There was nothing I could do about it. I got one call, though, and thank God my dad got involved, amen. He intervened. He came down, and when I explained the situation, he reached in his own pocket 
and he paid so that I could go free. Friends, our Heavenly Father loves us so much that he was willing to give his son to pay for our sin that we could go free. Listen, if you ever wonder whether God loves you, just look at the cross because it's there that he demonstrated his love. Why? Why does he demand blood as a sacrifice? Because blood's the only payment that he'll accept and he's got life. The blood carries life, but it also shows his love. John 3.16 tells us a verse that I don't have to tell you, you all about, but I just want to remind you today that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever, are you a whosoever? Do you fit that definition? So that whosoever believes on him should not perish. Because God doesn't want anybody to die apart from his son. Should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Why did he give his son to demonstrate his love? Out of all that God could have given, why did He choose the blood? Because of love. Listen, God could have given all the oil in Texas. He could have given all the diamonds in Africa. He could have given the earth. The Bible tells us the earth is the Lord's and everything in there, therein. He could have given the earth. He could have given the moon. But instead, He gave His Son. He gave His Son. The blood is the only payment that He accepts. And the way that we accept that payment is by faith. By faith. But friends, those of us that have believed, I just want to ask you a question. While we're gathered together as family today, a family of faith, a family of believers, since God did so much for us, He gave so much for, for you, what are we going to give to Him? Because here's the last benefit that I want to tell you about. The blood of Jesus puts us on a path, on a new path, so we can give God our very best. The blood of Jesus puts us on a new path so we can give God our very best. Look at this passage in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. And the Bible tells us, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Here's the deal. Before we gave our hearts and our lives to Jesus, even the best thing that we could do was stained and tarnished by our sin. Isaiah tells us this way. You'll be reminded that even our best works are as filthy rags before God. Why are they dead works? The Bible says that before we... We're living for Jesus that we lived in dead works. Why are they dead works? Because before we met Jesus, we were living for ourselves, working for ourselves. We were self-employed for self. But the day that we met Jesus, all of that changed. No longer living for ourselves, no longer for our own glory, no longer comparing ourselves to others, saying at least I'm not as bad as old so-and-so. Listen, I don't have hope because I'm uh, better than old so-and-so. I've got hope because I've believed in Jesus. Amen? No longer living for our own glory, but living to glorify God. And for those of us who trust in Jesus, that is our life. And that your life can bring immense glory to God when you put your life in His hands. But here's what I know as a pastor. I've been preaching for about 10 years. Some of y'all may not be able to know some of the sermons that come from behind this pulpit. But I've been preaching for about 10 years and I've been serving as a pastor now coming up on six years. And in that time, and even as a Christian, I've looked at people's lives and I know that so many people, Satan has so many people consumed with their past to think that my life could never bring glory to God. But listen, friend, it doesn't matter what the world says about you. The only thing that matters is that you would put your life in God's hands and He can do great and wondrous things through your life, no matter what your past, if you'll just put it in His hands. I've got a picture I want you to see this morning. We played a little game this week in our uh, online group, if we can find that. Some of you all played along, and I asked you to, there it is. I asked you all to try to figure out what this picture was. Now, I didn't give you the whole picture. 
It took us working together, but we finally came up with that this was a trumpet, and the technical term for that piece of rubber in the guy's hand is a mute. You know what it is. It's, it's a sink plunger. We'll call it a sink plunger since we're in church, amen? But it's not a sink plunger in his hand. It's an instrument that brings beauty to life when it's in his hand. What God is asking us to do, regardless of our past, regardless of our missteps, regardless of our failings, regardless of our insecurities, is to trust Him enough to say, God, I may not think that my life is worth much, but you must because you gave your Son for me. And I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to put all my frailties and all my weaknesses in your hands, and God, I'm going to let you do something great through me. Because the only thing that matters is what he says about us. Amen? This morning as we, as we think of how we might respond to this message, I just want to come out, I want to come out both guns blazing this morning. Has there been a time in your life where you have believed in Jesus? In a room this size, those watching online, somebody, somebody needs to give their life to Jesus and know the hope that we've talked about today. Listen, he lived for you and he died for you and he went into an empty tomb and he came out alive so that God could show us that his payment was good enough and it's all that we need. If there's never been a time in your life where you've trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of your wrongs, you can change that today and you can just tell God today, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong. I've broken your rules but I believe in what Jesus did for me. And I'm going to commit my life to him and ask you to change my heart. Let Jesus come in and he will save you today. But maybe you're here and you'd say, preacher, I settled that some time ago in my life. But you know what? I've been weighed down with guilt and I've been weighed down with shame over the way that I've been living. I don't feel as close to him as I, as I have been in the past. Listen, Jesus will meet you right where you are today. And you can come back to him because the same blood that saved you will cleanse you again today. And you can have that fellowship with God restored. Maybe there's somebody that, you, some, that God is putting on your heart that you need to be interceding for in the power of prayer. As far as you know, they don't know Jesus or they've wandered far from Jesus. Why don't you take a moment as, we, as our instrumentalists come now. We're going to have this time of song. For us to be able to respond to God today. And if you need somebody to talk to after service, we're gonna, I'm going to be right here and you just stay put. But they're going to come, we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing to give everybody a time to respond to God. Let's pray. Father, we come to you.